Um, I think one of the problems with the concept is that people focus only on the military side of, uh, of R2P, which is to be used as a last resort uh, when there's no other avenues open uh, to protecting civilians. Um, the NATO intervention was done with the UN Security Council approval. Um, they tried to actually negotiate with Gaddafi. He, uh, he dismissed anything or any responsibility for what he was doing. Um, and NATO was left with no choice but to actually take military action before the city of Benghazi was going to be leveled to the ground by the Libyan military. Um, when Gaddafi went house to house, uh, or when he, when he said he was going to go house to house, uh, saying over the, the radio airwaves, he was going to go house to house and kill the cockroaches, um, that sent off a danger, uh, a warning signal, to many capitals across the globe that, that realized that they must take military action, otherwise um, a city of uh, half a million people would have been destroyed. Um, I think the problem with, uh, with R2P is that people misunderstand uh, that it's actually a legitimate um, concept, that it's supported by international law. Um, and uh, the, the case in Libya, um, it was also supported by many of the regional governments in the Arab world. Uh, one of the problems with Syria is that early on, uh, both Russia and China used uh, their veto power to block any action, even rhetorical condemnation. They've gone on to do that four times. And Western governments have sat in the sidelines uh, saying that if we intervene, if we do anything, uh, we're going to make the situation worse. But if we look at it now, three years on, with 150,000 deaths, uh, with jihadist groups moving in to Syria and committing atrocities themselves now, is that we, we have to realize that, uh, that we can't be risk averse, that we have to stand up, uh, try to act upon uh, things early. Um, we could have tried to impose a no-fly zone. Uh, most of the civilian, civilian casualties caused by Assad were by using his air force against civilian populations. We could have tried to impose some kind of economic blockade uh, against the country to, to, to put pressure on it. Um, we, we simply did not take this seriously, and now we have a nightmare scenario that's going to take a long time to fix. The original R2P report uh, that was released in 2001 said that before you mobilize international political will, you must first mobilize domestic political will. And to do so, uh, one has to engage all the actors that make up foreign policy. Um, what happens usually is that human rights activists, international affairs experts, engage with the diplomatic core, with diplomats, which is important. But they're not the ones that can drive and push things and hold the, the executive branch of government to account. That's why it's very important to work with parliamentarians. Uh, in Canada, we have, uh, there's only two parliamentary groups in the world for the prevention of genocide, Canada and the UK. My institute makes supports and is the institutional partner of the Canadian group. Uh, we work with them to actually bring in expert speakers, to give them lessons and policy examples of other, what other countries are doing. And it's really become uh, an important aspect of, of trying to raise R2P up and put it on the radar screen of the foreign policy elite. I think there are a couple problems. First and foremost is that national governments and the United Nations um, don't really know what policy to pursue to prevent mass atrocity crimes. Particularly, what can we do early on to stop a government from going over the abyss and, and, and carrying out a genocide? Uh, there are a lot of early warning signs, looking at hate speech, incitement to commit violence, uh, demonizing an ethnic group or religious group in one, in one society. And what researchers need to do is they need to actually get resources to start researching these cases, provide real policy lessons for governments and international organizations.